Welcome to the 2009 National Assessment of Educational Progress High School Transcript Study. We will now start the presentation. Thank you, Jerry. My name is Cornelia Orr, and I also welcome you today to uh, this briefing on the release of these results. Today I will be taking David Gordon's place as your moderator. We will miss David's being here and wish him well. The Governing Board is an independent, bipartisan board that sets policy for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also called NAEP. The assessment results are reported to the country as the nation's report card. The Governing Board is pleased to host today's event. As most of you know, NAEP is the only ongoing nationally representative assessment of student performance in the United States and the only nationally representative measure of 12th grade achievement. Today's study is both of import and interest. Before we begin the data presentation, Gary, our webinar producer, will address logistics and mechanics for using the WebEx. But first, I'd like to run through our agenda. After Jerry makes sure we are WebEx savvy, Dr. Jack Buckley, Commissioner of the National Center for Educational Statistics, will present the 2009 NAEP High School Transcript Study results. Then Henry Cranendon will offer his perspective of the study. Henry is a member of the Governing Board and currently serves as a mathematics consultant and specialist for a variety of entities, including the Milwaukee Public Schools. Finally, we are pleased to welcome Katie Haycock, President of the Education Trust, to share her response on the results of the 2009 High School Transcript Study. We will conclude with a time for questions during the webinar and off-air at its completion. At its completion. But first, Jerry, please share with us what the attendees need to know. Thank you, Cornelia. If you'd like to ask a question at any time today through our Q&A feature, You'll find it in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply look for the Q&A tab, type in your question, and make sure you submit the question to all panelists. When you do submit your question, please put in your name and your organization. Now back to you, Cornelia. Thanks, Jerry. Let's begin. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Buckley. Dr. Buckley is the Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics, He's on leave from his position as Professor of Applied Statistics at NYU. He is known for his research on school choice, particularly charter schools, and on statistical methods for public policy. Dr. Buckley, thank you for being here. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Cornelia. And good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today to give you the results from the 2009 High School Transcript Study, or HSTS, conducted periodically as part of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. The NAEP High School Transcript Study Report provides detailed information on the academic experiences and performance of America's high school graduates. First, a few notes. All high school transcript study results, whether percentages, averages, scale scores, or achievement level percentages, are based on samples. This means that there is a margin of error associated with every score and percentage. In the figures that I'll show you today, we use asterisks to indicate statistically significant differences. Results for private school students are included within the overall results presented today. However, not enough private schools participated to allow us to release reliable results for them. The 2009 NAEP High School Transcript Study is the sixth study in the series that began in 1990. The 2009 HSTS is a nationally representative sample of students who graduated from high school in 2009. Results are based on a sample of 37,700 graduates and their transcripts. These transcripts were collected from 740 public and private schools across the country. Transcript collection took place from June 2009 through January 2010. The study examines student course taking patterns and grades, showing trends in course taking over time. Most of the time, I'll be comparing 2009 with the earliest assessment, 1990, and the most recent prior assessment in 2005. But in some cases, we'll be using a shorter timeline, only going back to 1998 or 2000. In addition to overall results, we'll also be looking at gender and race ethnicity differences. First, we'll look at information on credits earned based on student transcripts. HSTS identifies three types of courses. Core academic credits are the main classes high school students take, such as English, mathematics, science, and social studies. Other academic courses include fine arts, foreign languages, and computer-related studies. Other credits include courses in vocational education, 
personal health, and physical education. To standardize our reports of course thinking, we use the Carnegie definition of a credit, 120 hours of classroom instruction. HSTS reports on the average course credits earned as well as grade point average. In both cases, we have overall results and separate results for each course type. This slide shows the changes in the average course credits earned by high school graduates since 1990. The 2009 graduates earned more credits in core academic courses than in any past study year, increasing from an average of 13.7 credits in 1990, as shown by the bar at the top, to 16 credits in 2009, shown by the bar at the bottom. Graduates also earned more credits overall in other academic courses, increasing from 3.6 credits in 1990 to 5.3 credits in 2009, as shown by the blue bars. And when we bring in the other credits, shown by the orange bars, and add them up, we see that the total average credits increased from 23.6 in 1990 to 27.2 in 2009, more than any previous graduation class for which we've conducted a study. Factors that may be related to increasing credits include online courses. With the rise of these online courses, students may have more opportunities outside of the traditional classroom. Information from the high school transcript study indicates that about 5% of graduates took online courses for credit. And also, credit for classes taken in middle school. Students are taking what were once considered high school courses now before entering high school. For example, Algebra 1, Biology, or Spanish 1. A substantial number of these students are earning high school credit for these courses. Among the 2009 graduates, for example, 26% took Algebra 1 before entering high school. This next graph shows the changes over time in the average number of credits earned by graduates in each of the four major racial ethnic groups. Comparing 1990 to 2009, all four racial ethnic groups earned a higher number of credits. Comparing 2009 to 2005, only, only white and black students had increases in the number of credits earned. The average number of credits for black students, shown by the light blue line, increased from 23.5 in 1990 to 26.9 in 2005 and to 27.4 in 2009. This slide shows changes over time for all graduates' grade point average. From 1990 to 2009, overall GPA increased from 2.68 to 3.0 points. Over the same time period, GPA increased for each of the three course types. Other courses, as shown by the orange line at the top, other academic courses, shown by the black line, and core academic, the gray line at the bottom. From 2005 to 2009, however, GPAs did not change measurably for core courses or other academic courses. The HSTS examines course-taking patterns in two ways. By looking at the level of the curriculum a, standard, a student takes, whether standard, which is the least demanding, mid-level, or rigorous, and by looking at course taking in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what we call STEM. In particular, we'll be addressing STEM advanced mathematics, STEM advanced science and engineering, and STEM related technical courses. The first perspective on course taking is curriculum level. How many academic credits a graduate takes during high school? Curriculum levels are a measure of high school graduates' overall academic achievement. They can help measure how well graduates are prepared for post-secondary education based on the number and type of academic courses taken. We define three curriculum levels for this study. The standard level includes four credits in English and three each in the three remaining core subjects. The mid-level includes all of the standard credits plus more challenging requirements for mathematics and science, along with a foreign language requirement. <laughs> And the rigorous level includes all of the mid-level requirements, plus additional requirements for mathematics, science, and foreign language. Any curriculum that does not meet the requirements for the standard level is considered below standard. Since 1990, graduates have been completing more challenging curricula. As these black bars show from 1990 to 2009, the percentage of graduates completing a below standard curriculum decreased by 35 points from 60% to 25%. The percentage completing a standard curriculum rose six points. There was an increase of 20 points for graduates completing a mid-level curriculum from 26% in 1990 to 46% in 2009, 
and there was an eight-point increase for graduates completing a rigorous curriculum during the same time period. When we compare the changes over time and the percentages of graduates completing the various curriculum levels by race ethnicity, we see a variety of patterns. The percentages of black and white graduates completing a mid-level curriculum since 1998 have increased for both groups. The blue line here shows increases for white graduates, while the orange line shows increases for black graduates. In 1998, 35% of white graduates and 34% of black graduates had completed a mid-level curriculum. The difference in the two percentages was not statistically significant. In 2009, however, a greater percentage of black than white graduates completed this mid-level curriculum, 51% compared to 45. This six-point gap was statistically significant, as was the six-point gap in 2005. Looking at the percentages completing a rigorous, a rigorous curriculum since 1998, we see increases for white graduates only. 14% of white students completed this highest level of curriculum compared to 6% of black students. This eight-point gap is larger than the previous gap of five points in 2005 and the two previous assessments. This next set of graphs compare patterns of curriculum completion for white and Hispanic students. Again, the blue lines show the percentages for white graduates over time, while the orange lines show results for Hispanic students. The percentages of both white and Hispanic graduates completing a mid-level curriculum were higher in 2009 than in 1998. The increase for Hispanic graduates was larger than the increase for white graduates, eliminating the 10-point gap that existed in 1998. The two-point difference in 2009 favoring Hispanic graduates was, however, not statistically significant. For the rigorous level, however, only white graduates showed a statistically significant increase in their percentage of completion from 1998 to 2009, resulting in an increase in the gap from five to six points. This next slide compares completion percentages for white and Asian Pacific Islander students. The percentage of both white and Asian Pacific Islander graduates completing a mid-level curriculum was 35% in 1998. In 2009, the percentage for white graduates was 45% seven points higher than the percentage for Asian Pacific Islander graduates. A greater percentage of Asian Pacific Islander graduates than white graduates, however, completed a rigorous curriculum. This was true in all four comparison years. In 2009, 29% of Asian Pacific Islander graduates completed a rigorous curriculum compared to 14% of white graduates. This 15-point gap in 2009 was larger than the seven-point gap in 1998. For the 2009 HSTS report, we examined the requirements that students lacked to reach the next higher curriculum level. So among graduates who attained a standard curriculum but did not attain a mid-level curriculum, we found that 35% lacked only the science requirements needed to achieve a mid-level curriculum. This percentage was higher than the percentage who lacked only, say, the mathematics or foreign language course, and higher than the percentage who lacked more than one required course. And of those, the, those who 29% of graduates who did lack more than one required course, a majority of those were lacking a science course as one of their courses. For the 2009 high school transcript study, we also looked at factors that might be associated with achieving higher curriculum levels. And algebra one course taking before high school is one of those factors. This slide provides 2005 and 2009 data for all graduates, as well as individual results for the four major, major racial ethnic groups. The blue bars indicate the percentages of graduates who took algebra before high school in 2005, while the orange bars give the percentages who did so in 2009. For all graduates, the percentage increased from 20 to 26 percent. And all four racial ethnic groups showed an increase as well. In 2009, Nearly half of Asian Pacific Islander graduates took Algebra I before high school. This next slide shows the average NAIF 12th grade mathematics scores of graduates according to the level of curriculum completed. Graduates completing a below standard curriculum had an average score of 142, placing them at the cut point for students on the NAIF, at the NAIF basic achievement level. Graduates completing the standard and mid-level curricula also fell in the basic range. Graduates completing a rigorous curriculum scored, on average, in the proficient range. 
On this slide, we look at the same information for the four major racial ethnic groups. Within each group, graduates completing a rigorous curriculum earned higher NAEP scores on average than graduates completing lower curricula. However, the completion of a rigorous curriculum does not indicate an elimination of racial ethnic gaps in NAEP mathematics performance, as you can see. The average scores for black and Hispanic graduates completing a rigorous curriculum were lower than the average score for white graduates, which in turn were lower than the average score for Asian Pacific Islander graduates. And this pattern holds true for each of the remaining curriculum levels, as you can see when we bring in the bars to those levels, black for below standard, red for standard, and gray for mid-level. Now, while the differences shown here are statistically significant, this does not mean that race ethnicity is the determining factor in creating these differences. Differences in student performance are influenced by many factors and not simply the one shown here. We also have results by gender. Male graduates, male graduates completing a rigorous curriculum, on average, had higher 12th grade NAEP mathematics scores than female graduates. In 2009, these male graduates had an average 12th grade NAEP mathematics score of 192, compared to 185 for female graduates. This was also true for male and female graduates taking mid-level and below standard curricula. Mm -hmm. To compete globally and keep up with expanding scientific and technical expertise, educators and policymakers have called for increasing emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, course taking in our schools. As part of the 2009 high school transcript study, we took a closer look at STEM course taking. Here we provide the definitions we use for STEM courses today. STEM advanced mathematics courses include Algebra II, other advanced mathematics such as trigonometry, statistics and probability, pre-calculus, and calculus. STEM advanced science and engineering courses include advanced biology, chemistry, advanced environmental or earth science, physics, and engineering. And STEM-related technical courses include engineering, science, technology, health science, technology, and computer science and related courses. We'll begin by looking at STEM advanced mathematics course taking, looking at differences by gender in particular. In 2009, the percentage of female graduates taking STEM advanced mathematics was higher than that of males, 85% as compared to 82 Higher percentages of female graduates also took Algebra II and pre-calculus or analysis. And for other advanced mathematics and calculus, there was no statistically significant difference. Overall, a higher percentage of female graduates also took STEM advanced science and engineering courses. However, this is not always the case when we look at individual courses. Higher percentages of female than male graduates took advanced biology and chemistry courses but higher percentages of male graduates took physics and engineering. For advanced environmental or earth science, there was no apparent difference. And for the STEM-related technical courses, male graduates had higher percentages overall for engineering and science technologies and computer science courses, while for health science and technology courses, the percentage of female graduates was higher. Now I'd like to look at the percentages of graduates who took, in particular, advanced placement or international baccalaureate courses in 2009 by race ethnicity. The brown bars show the percentages taking AP or IB mathematics courses, while the green bars are for AP, IB science. For both types of courses, the percentages for Asian Pacific Islander graduates, 42% for mathematics and 38% for science, were higher than for any other group. The percentages for white graduates were higher than the percentages for either black or Hispanic graduates. And when we look at AP, IB, mathematics, and science course, uh, course taking according to gender, we see no significant difference for mathematics as shown again here by the brown bars. For science, however, the percentage of female graduates is higher, 15% as compared to 13 that completes my overview of the results from the 2009 NAEP High School Transcript Study. There's much more information in the full report, and in addition, the NAEP website will give you access to more information on the study and earlier studies, as well as access to the NAEP High School Transcript Study Data Explorer, which allows you to perform your own analyses of the topics we've discussed here, as well as many others. In closing, I'd like to thank the students and schools who participated in these assessments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Buckley. Next, we turn to Henry Cranendonk.
a governing board member. Henry is a mathematics curriculum consultant for the Milwaukee Public Schools and a mathematics specialist for Marquette University Educational Opportunity Program. Among other duties, he is also a lecturer and consultant for the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and is involved in curriculum writing projects for various organizations. Henry will discuss his perspective of the results with a lens from his vast experience of mathematics teaching in his home city of Milwaukee. Thank you for being with us today, Henry. Thank you, Tanya. I am pleased to be part of this panel to discuss the National Assessment of Educational Progress 2009 High School Transcript Study. I served as a mathematics curriculum specialist for seven years and taught math at the high school level for 32 years in the Milwaukee Public Schools. As a result, I have an obvious interest in seeing trends on some of the courses our nation's graduates have taken and the grades and credits they have earned. The report didn't necessarily surprise me. As someone who has taught advanced math classes, I know that a higher level curriculum makes a difference, not just in students' NAEP scores, but also in the ability to handle the challenging coursework and to be better prepared for life after high school. This report made me think about the larger implications and the challenges of providing this kind of curriculum. First, I'm a firm believer that science and math are critical subjects in which students often need extra support throughout their high school experience. Background data on this report that can be found online bear this out. In 2009, students who took their last science course in 10th grade scored 11 points lower on NAEP than peers who took their last science course at 10th grade and scored 11 and 27 points lower than peers who took science on 12th grade. Likewise, students who took their last mathematics course in 10th grade scored 8 points lower than peers who took their last math course at 11th grade and 24 points lower than peers who took math in 12th grade. It is clear that students benefit from a more challenging curriculum. Although more advanced course taking is certainly a tangible goal in this endeavor to improve student performance, there are other important factors to be considered. In my area of Milwaukee, there are schools in the suburbs that consistently offer higher level math and science courses. Good news. But two miles down the road in urban Milwaukee, there are schools with remarkably fewer course offerings, providing the opportunity for a course like calculus with an enrollment anywhere from 8 to 12 students is definitely a challenge. Students find it, schools find it hard to justify offering a class for so few students, especially when funding cuts have to be made. Other options for meeting the needs of students are available and have been attempted, including busing students from neighboring schools to consolidated classes in distance learning or online learning opportunities. However, these options also can be costly, for example, transportation and may not be suitable for all students. My hope is that we can continue to explore ways for equitable access to these important courses for students. Access to challenging math and science courses is not enough. It's only part of the solution. The content in these courses must be delivered in an accurate and rigorous manner by trained and certified teachers. This is a great challenge for our schools, not just those in our urban areas. A real concern of mine is how we will incorporate algebra into the eighth grade curriculum so those students can get a leg up on their math courses in high school. Quite a few states, like California, are pushing for this more vigorously. The Common Core State Standards, which is coming up, certainly calls for more algebra topics at the middle grade level. For these initiatives to be successful and equitable for all students, the mathematics background of 8th grade and 7th grade teachers must improve to meet this challenge. This will require an investment in teacher training. If algebra is taught nationally at the 8th grade level, middle grade mathematics teachers training and certification will need to include more algebra and not just general middle school mathematics. The University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, a campus where I teach, offers a minor for middle grade certification in mathematics with genuine topic-specific courses. We're finding more and more teacher training candidates are taking advantage of that opportunity. A similar offering is also designed in science and STEM, 
The bottom line is we need to increase the quality and rigor of teaching. For the class of 2009, there was a 36-point gap in mathematics scores between students who took Algebra 1 in high school and those students who took Algebra 1 before high school, a gap similar to what you saw in 2005. Early exposure makes a difference, but we must have targeted training to bring students to the highest level possible. Even with universal eighth grade algebra, there will be students whose developmental needs will require additional algebra as they enter high school. We still have to provide multiple pathways for kids. I am concerned about creating an environment that may be perceived as a blocking student from preparing for post-secondary education or employment simply because they did not successfully complete a math curriculum that includes algebra in the middle grade. During the four years of high school, there is exciting potential and an opportunity for our youth to achieve what we dream of in this country. There will be a need for high schools to help prepare kids for various paths, whether it's a four-year university, a technical college, military service, or employment, with appropriate rigor and substance. The landscape in our schools is more complicated today. As I look back at my first years of teaching nearly 40 years ago, I sometimes reflect on how much simpler it was. There were only four or five math courses, algebra, geometry, advanced math, and pre-calculus. Now I'm working at Marquette University with students who are behind and who are taking classes like statistics or the mathematics of finance, and these students would have benefited from courses in these areas during their high school experience. This NAEP study makes me wonder if we're catching up with that landscape. Are we doing all we can to provide the best possible courses, instruction, and learning? We certainly need to. Our students and our future depend on this. I would now turn this back to Cornelia. Thank you, Henry. Now we turn to Katie Haycock. We are very fortunate to have her a leading advocate in the field of education who is with us today. Katie currently serves as president of the Education Trust, an organization that works for access and high academic achievement of all students and at all levels, pre-K through college. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Cornelia. Now, for years, national leaders have been sounding an alarm about the need to ensure that students graduating from high school, all students graduating from high school, leave actually equipped with the knowledge and skills that they need to succeed in college and the workplace. It appears that our students are getting that message, but the results from this transcript study are a kind of sobering reminder of how much work uh, remains to be done. Now, importantly, data from the study show some real progress, especially for students of color, whom in, uh, in, in many, for many years have been shunted into lower-level courses. All groups of graduates are now earning more cre uh, credits toward at least the standard curriculum, and about half of African-American students and about half of Latino graduates now complete a mid-level curriculum. These trends matter because higher level coursework is indeed associated, as Jack mentioned, with better outcomes for students. African American students, for example, who took a rigorous curriculum scored 45 points higher on the NAEP mathematics exam than those who took a standard curriculum, a difference, by the way, that is far greater than the 29 point achievement gap between all African American 12th graders and their white counterparts. And when it comes to post-secondary success, eight of every 10 students who take the most intense curriculum in high school eventually complete that bachelor's degree that they need for lifetime earning success, where, whereas the success rates drop to just one in 10 among students who took the lower, lowest level coursework. Now, despite the good news, and it's good, uh, at the lower end of the curriculum spectrum, it's very clear that we aren't making nearly enough progress getting students into the most rigorous curriculum that many colleges are looking for. Far too many students, especially those who are African American or Latino, <coughs> excuse me, still do not have the kind of high school experience that they need. African-American and Latino graduates, for example, are about one-half as likely as white graduates to complete that most rigorous curriculum, and there's been no improvement in that number since 2005. In addition, when you look at grades, um, you have to worry. The grades earned by African-American and Latino graduates uh, are stagnating. On average, 
African American and Latino graduates have grade point averages somewhere between a kind of B and a B minus, whereas white and Asian graduates have GPAs closer to a B plus, between a B and a B plus. GPAs among <coughs> Latino graduates haven't improved since 1998, and among African American students, there have been no uh, improvement since 2005. Because, as, uh, as Jack mentioned earlier, the, the GPAs of white students are increasing, what that means is that the gaps between groups are actually widening. For Latinos and whites, for example, the, the gap <coughs> that separates them has doubled since 1990. Despite the general link between taking a more rigorous curriculum uh, and higher test performance, improvements in the performance among students of color have actually lagged behind improvements in high school course taking. Among uh, students who are completing the same level of, of curriculum, African American Latino graduates' knowledge and skills lag actually quite far behind uh, those of their white and Asian counterparts. Latinos, for example, who complete a mid-level curriculum are performing about as well on an AP math and science assignments as white students who complete a below standard curriculum. And African American students who complete the most rigorous curriculum are actually performing at about uh, the same level as white graduates completing a mid-level curriculum. Now, when you have a picture like that that shows higher level course taking with little or no progress and achievement, you've got to raise serious questions about the level of course rigor in schools serving many students of color. Now, I know that there are people who argue that there's kind of an unavoidable, unavoidable trade-off here between greater and more equitable access to courses like Algebra II or Chemistry and Physics and the actual rigor of those courses. People uh, often suggest uh, that if we let more students in to these courses, we'll inevitably lower their quality. Certainly, um, we do see that lower pattern of course quality in some schools, but we also know it doesn't have to be this way, that this idea that we have to choose somehow between access and excellence is dead wrong. My colleagues and I at the Ed Trust have studied high schools across the country that are working for all students, and we know from them that increased course rigor and higher achievement can and should go hand in hand. At schools like Elmont Memorial Junior Senior High School in New York, for example, more students are taking the most rigorous courses than at other high schools, and achievement for all groups of students is far higher than at other high schools in New York State. But again, at far too many other schools, schools without a focus on strong instruction, a rigorous curriculum is often rigorous in name only. So what can we do to change this? States are increasingly focused, as Henry mentioned, on ensuring their students are college and career ready. And they're beginning to put in place uh, higher standards and more rigorous assessments that actually align with this new goal. But in order for this sort of critical and potentially game-changing work to actually live up to the promise of college and career readiness for all, higher standards and assessments have to be coupled with access for students to rigorous coursework with strong, well-supported teachers. Unfortunately, we know that this is not what happens now. African-American Latino students in particular are still less likely to attend high schools that offer high-level math and uh, math courses like trig uh, and calculus, which severely limits their ability to take the courses they'll, be, uh, they'll need to be successful in STEM fields. And even in, in schools where high-level courses are available, students of color too often can't take them, unfortunately because of decisions made earlier in their academic career. Consider, for example, almost two-thirds of the graduates who complete a rigorous curriculum actually took algebra before high school. But even when you look at the highest achieving African-American fifth graders, what you learn is that only about 35% of them are enrolled in eighth grade algebra compared to nearly two-thirds of high-achieving white fifth graders. Of course, enrolling in a course with a certain name is certainly not enough. Even when two courses have the same name or even use the same textbook, there's no guarantee that they will be equally rigorous. In our experience, students of color often receive less rigorous assignments than their peers in schools or districts with lower concentrations of minority students. A transition to more rigorous 
standards will certainly help this process, but implementing those standards consistently across districts and classrooms is critical. To support high achievement for all students, teachers will need access to curricular support materials and professional development opportunities that provide examples of and guidance on developing high-quality lessons and assignments. We also need to assure that students have access to teachers who are qualified to teach the subjects that they're assigned to teach. Students certainly have higher math achievement when their teacher actually has a background in that subject, especially at the high school level. However, nearly one in three math classes in high minority high schools are taught by teachers who did not major in nor are certified to teach mathematics. Today's transcript study re results represent, in other words, not just failure on the part of kids, but systemic failure on the part of our public schools. Students, in fact, are doing what's asked of them, but they aren't being taught any more than the predecessors were. While we've made progress in some areas, far more work remains to be done to ensure that all students are equipped with the knowledge and skills that they need to be successful in college and in life. Thank you, Katie. All of our presenters today have certainly given us plenty to think about. Now we would like to address the questions that you have about our presentation today. Um, we will have Amy Buckley, who will facilitate the question and answer session, so I'll turn it over to her from now. Thank you so much, Cornelia, and thank you to all of our panelists. For those of you wishing to ask questions, please, please do so now. As Jerry mentioned at the beginning, we ask that you direct them to all panelists so that they don't slip through the cracks. Also, we've had a great response thus far and have multiple questions that have already been submitted. If we are not able to get to your question, please know that we will respond to you, and we thank you so much for your interest. Our first question comes from Jamal abdul Alim from Diverse Issues in Higher Education. Jamal asks, what are the implications of this study for college administrators who are charged with providing post-secondary education? Should they plan on devoting more resources towards remediation, or should they expect fewer students to enroll, or perhaps another scenario? Cornelia, can you begin to address that? Well, I wish there were clear answers from the data that we've seen today. Um, I think that the board's research effort on preparedness is trying to provide some answers about how really prepared students are based on what the NAEP uh, scores tell them. But this research is in progress, and we do not have answers on all of these issues yet, but should by the end of this year. Uh, I think for now, colleges know the students they're receiving. They're working with their local high school and their local school districts, and they should continue with the plans that they have in place. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Our next question comes from Joy Dingle with Achieving Equality. Joy asks, what are practical steps we can take to increase the quality of the courses our students take and complete? Henry and Katie, you both addressed this in your uh, comments. Henry, perhaps you could start. Thank you. Um, I would address this question by targeting three uh, areas first. Um, number one, I think we uh, schools should look at the quality and background of the teachers involved in these courses. Um, certainly teachers teaching more advanced uh, level mathematics and the grade levels need that background. Two, the rigor of the course defined by the depth in the topic, not just the uh, amount of topics, should be well organized around established standards. Um, certainly we are very hopeful in this country that the topics or that the uh, initiative around the common core state standards may bring to, to the standards. But there are many standards out there that can provide that organization. And three, I think the teaching force should always be in partnership with university or colleges and their own content training and ongoing professional development um, in these risk courses. Let, let me just add one quick note to that. Um, you know, the last time states rolled out their academic standards, they essentially left it to teachers, to local districts, to local schools, and often to individual teachers to figure out how to teach kids to those standards. And the net result of that was that um, 
we have, we have very uneven interpretations of what kind of lessons, units, assignments teachers use, very uneven interpretations of what student work is good enough to meet standards. I think there's increasing consensus that we can't leave it to teachers this time. They don't want to do the work, they're too busy doing other things, and we've got to provide much more guidance this time around. A banks of lessons, units, assignments uh, that are really high quality that teachers can draw on and adapt to their own students to make sure we get more consistency this time around. Thank you so much, Katie. Our next question comes from Maisie McAdoo with United Federation of Teachers. Maisie asks, can the study tell us whether online learning, either for AP coursework or for credit recovery, is successful in readying students for college? Dr. Peggy, can you start? Well, sure. That's a great question, and I should first provide a general caveat that I always find myself providing on these release days is, you know, a study like NAEP uh, is great at, at letting us describe the state, you know, the condition of education in the United States. Uh, not usually the best source for something causal by trying to determine whether or not a particular curriculum or course or trajectory is actually going to improve uh, or, or benefit uh, students of a particular type. Uh, that said, we do, uh, within the high school transcript study, we do have uh, some data on online learning. In, in the actual report on uh, page 48 of the main report, for example, uh, we disaggregate or we show uh, average scores on NAEP mathematics and, uh, by, and, and science by, for graduates by whether or not they took an online mathematics or science course. So for example, in online mathematics, there was a statistically significant difference where students who did not take the course on average scored 156, while students who did take at least one online mathematics course scored lower, uh, statistically lower at 141. Now, of course, what I'm trying to say is that does not prove that taking that online mathematics course causes those students to you know, score lower on NAEP. As you know from your question, that there's a, sort of a heterogeneous population of people who take uh, online courses, and some because there are not advanced courses offered at their institution, uh, others who are taking these courses for credit recovery, and it's possible that their scores could have been lower, lower still had they not taken the, the online course. I would encourage uh, people who are interested in, in looking at this in greater depth to use our online tool, the, the NAEP Data Explorer, where you can fit a, you know, a somewhat more complicated model and, and try and control for other factors while you're looking at that question. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Lynn Schaefer-Wilner with George Washington University. She asks, how do you address concerns about the validity of ELL scores if ELL accommodation rates are so variable across states. Peggy? Again, another uh, uh, question. Uh, so first I should point out that uh, we don't have state level data here for uh, this uh, study, but it's still a good question because it's something that we are continuing to address. Since the late 1990s, in fact, the program has addressed two major issues associated with special needs students, students with disabilities, and English language learners. For first, inclusion, we have focused most predominantly on and made, I, I should say, quite a bit of progress over this time. Uh, uh, currently, about uh, we have made progress about two-thirds more of the students are included uh, in the sample than uh, was the case uh, back in the 90s. Uh, Nevertheless, the variation across states uh, still remain. Uh, there's more progress to be made, but we, we're gaining ground with the inclusion issue. The second uh, area, uh, as noted by your question, would be in accommodations. The literacy issues regarding accommodations are more difficult to address, um, primarily because students uh, often take more than one accommodation. So, uh, having one accommodation is a rare uh, occurrence, uh, actually and states vary quite a bit in whether their students are accommodated. Some states, as much as 80% of their special needs students are accommodated, others hardly any. We've done some experimental studies, quasi-experimental studies, focusing on specific types of accommodations and gotten a lot more comfortable with the validity interpretation of those data. But the program of research must continue. Thank you so much, Peggy. Our next question is from John Siffel with Cornell University and the New York State Center of Rural Schools. He asks, 
With the NAEP sample, are we able to reliably estimate courses taken and performance in such courses for students attending rural school districts? Specifically, are there differences in course taking and course performance in STEM courses in rural versus suburban versus urban schools? Yeah. Another great question. Fortunately, uh, we, we are able to disaggregate uh, our results uh, for, for various of the, of the measures we have today by what we call locale, right, where we generally divide the world into uh, cities, suburbs, towns, and, and rural areas, and then there are subdivisions within each of those. And, and we do find some very interesting, important differences. I, I would say uh, perhaps the, the most important one is, although course taking is important, there's simply access to the courses, and Katie alluded to this uh, in, in a couple of areas. If the courses aren't offered uh, and there's not a good online infrastructure that can offer a comparable course, it's, you know, students simply can't take them. And we find that there is a, a very large difference uh, within the, the rural areas in who has access to or where courses are offered, uh, particularly in advanced science. So, for example, uh, you know, in some of the rural areas, depending on how remote they are uh, from the nearest urban population center, we could find that as few as 50% as of uh, students will, will have access to uh, advanced science course taking. The, the numbers tend to be higher uh, for mathematics, and, and we suspect, although I can't, I can't show from the NAEP data, we suspect this is because it's, it's easier at the end of the day to hire a mathematics teacher and offer a calculus course than it is to actually have a science lab or some of the facilities that you need to offer advanced science. And I would also encourage you, uh, again, to look at the, uh, the, the online data tool because you can, you can use this uh, locale breakdown to look at a lot of interesting uh, issues in rural education with these data. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Elaine White. She asks, it is clear that students across the board are making gains in course credit, rigor of courses, and NAEP scores. Yet we continue to hear that minority students, especially, are flat or losing ground. How do we correct this? Cornelia, do you want to start and perhaps thank you? Well, certainly we want to thank you for the question and say we certainly don't have all of the answers to getting all of the problems solved. You've uh, heard suggestions from Henry and Katie today about ensuring that the coursework that students have access to, first of all, have access to coursework, and secondly, have access to rigorous instruction and uh, comprehensive learning by students. So I think those, those things, as well as what Henry mentioned about having stronger teachers who have the background needed to teach the curriculum in the classroom. So um, those are some suggestions that I have. Peggy? Yes, this is Peggy Carr, Associate Commissioner for Assessment. Um, I don't have any of the answers in there, Cornelia, but uh, I think it would be helpful to sort of uh, help everyone understand how to think about these data. So uh, there are a lot of confounds here. Uh, the, the students of various racial ethnic backgrounds differ uh, disproportionately, for example, in their uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, blacks and Hispanics uh, are predominantly uh, in these data and other made data that uh, we explore, about 80% are uh, eligible for free and reduced price lunch as compared to about 30% for their white counterparts. So that's an important confound that I think we need to keep in mind. There are other uh, factors that uh, might be correlated with these uh, um, scores that we see, the qualifications of their teachers, whether they have um, degrees, major or minor, in the areas that they are uh, given to teach, the experience uh, they have in making, um, teaching these courses, and just so many other factors. I think Katie uh, so elegantly described uh, issues associated with the rigor of the courses. In fact, we have a study coming out uh, later this year that will explore rigor of the courses by looking at textbooks, the chapters covered in those textbooks, the questions asked of the students regarding those uh, chapters and the outlines teachers use for those particular courses. And these courses have the same title, uh, Algebra 1 and Geometry. So right. we'll be able to, to give you a look uh, into these processes that uh, have been uh, supported here. So there, there are no uh, silver bullets. A lot of compounds to be considered, but many questions uh, to be answered. 
Yeah, I think Peggy would agree, though, that while, while there's a fair amount that can explain this, the real question in most people's mind is, okay, what do we do, right? What do, what do we do to change these patterns? Um, and when you look at the schools that are exceptions to these, um, the patterns we've been talking about nationally, the answers are really pretty clear. You know, number one, it's about making sure you get kids of color and poor kids into the tougher, <clears throat> into the tougher courses. Number two, it's about making sure their teachers know what they're doing, right, and are well supported. Number three, it's about assuring some consistency and rigor by providing those teachers with a, with um, lessons, units, assignments, example system work, and so on that they need to to get consistent rigor. Um, and and number four, it's about providing kids the kind of on-time uh, support that they need when they're struggling uh, to match the material. And schools and districts that are working on those four things are getting much better results. We just need to do that at scale. Thank you, Katie. Our next question is from Marie O'Hara. She asks, were you able to look at the difference in achievement levels for states with higher or more rigorous course requirements for graduation and those with lower requirements? Jeff? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, no. Although our, our sample size is, is large, uh, it's not large enough to be state representative. And it turns out, you know, doing an a in-depth transcript analysis at, at that scale, uh, is, right now it's too big a project that we haven't been able to take on. So we're not able to actually give you state representative uh, comparisons like that, although it's, it, it's a great question. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Strait. He would like to know if there's any more information you can provide on the criteria for curriculum classification. Was it just the course title? In California, for example, many CTE courses have been approved for a G credit. Would this course count towards rigorous or mid-level, or would they be in the other category by virtue of title? You know, uh, A to G is the, is the name for the Cal State and University of California. Um, uh, approved um, academic course requirements for college. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I, you know, I'm happy to answer that. The, so, so the short answer is no, and, and the longer answer is, is uh, we have something called a, a common course coding system called the Classification of Secondary School Courses, or CSSC, which is itself a, a modification of something you may be familiar with. It's a little more uh, common called the SIP, or the Classification of Instructional Programs. So the, the uh, courses that appear on a student transcript get a six-digit code, which is based on the course content and the level, not the title alone. We, we have about uh, 2,200 codes, uh, and we use course catalogs and other materials from the schools to figure out the content and the level of the courses, so not simply taking the titles from the transcript. Great, thank you. The next question is from Gail Howell. Gail asks, why is Native American data not in this study? This is Peggy Carr, uh, the Associate Commissioner. The sample size for Native Americans simply just was not uh, large enough to report out. We had reporting uh, rules, limitations for uh, reporting samples, and they, they just did not uh, have enough. Now, this is a huge sample, but we would have to do some special targeting sample to include Native Americans for uh, a study like this. Great. Thank you, Peggy. Our next question is from Susan Rara. Susan would like to know what about the arts? Recognizing that access to arts can help at risk or low performing students. Did this NAPE study study access to arts and the relationship of arts course taking to overall high school performance and college readiness? Again, this is Peggy Carr. We do include a fine language, as um, the commissioner indicated uh, earlier, in mid-level and in and the rigorous uh, curriculum level de designation. Uh, fine arts uh, is also part of the uh, inclusion in a particular level of fine arts. Um, yes, mid-level. Mid-level includes fine arts. So uh, we do have the inclusion of some of these courses. Um, but the more final gradations we would have to uh, get to from. Great. Thank you, Peggy. Our next question is from Holly Elliott with Shelton State Community College. 
She'd like to know if we can provide more details about the demographics of the 740 public and private schools that were included in this study. Dr. Petty? Uh, sure. So, what I mentioned at the very beginning uh, of the presentation that we're dealing with a sample here, and what I didn't say anything about was sort of how was that sample drawn. And so if we took just a uh, sort of a simple random sample of, of 740 schools and then students within schools, we would be very unlikely, in fact, to, to match the, uh, the demographics of the country, which is why instead we take a, a, a very complex sample uh, where we're, in some cases, oversampling uh, uh, some places, uh, places where we're likely to get certain types of students that we want to be able to report on, and other places we're uh, ensuring that we draw schools from a particular district that's necessary, otherwise we would not be represented in the United States places like you know, New York City, for example. Uh, once we have those data, however, because we know a lot about how we design the sample, we know everything about how we design the sample, we're, we actually are able to construct weights that make the data uh, representative of the demographics of the country. And so the, I guess the short answer is that if you just had access to the raw data, they would not uh, match the, the national demographics, but once we use the correct weights and analysis, they do. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Brad Sindel. Brad states that the CCSS includes Algebra 1 for grade 8 for all students, complicating course-taking patterns across middle and high schools and perhaps invalidating continued longitudinal trend data. Is the governing board and NCES anticipating this? Uh, we have been following the work of the Common Core State Standards and the Common Core Assessment Consortium very carefully. And actually, in his remarks, Governing Board Member uh, Henry Cranenda mentioned how this is going to be changing the landscape at middle school. So we are aware of it. We do not know how it will affect the transcript study because, as uh, Dr. Buckley mentioned a minute ago, we examine what's actually taught in the coursework, and so we are hopeful that the longitudinal trend can continue. Great. I would like to... Henry, go ahead. This is Henry Cronadon. I would like to add to that that um, I think many of us feel the uh, many facets of uh, our achievement work, work through the NAEP will be enhanced by this new effort. Um, by that I mean I am particularly, as a math, former math teacher and math curriculum specialist, looking to see how NAEP achievement scores will change in the future as a result of the Common Core State Standards. My hope, of course, is that the standards actually are providing that definition and articulation of the rigor that um, we addressed in our comments that is very inconsistent, both um, in course descriptions and across the country. And by bringing that consistency, I, I'm hopeful um, and actually optimistic that the achievement of our kids will improve, and that improvement, I hope, will definitely be shown in improved achievement scores in our, our NAEP assessments. So I, I think it remains as a, as a way to monitor and look at how successful this initiative will be. And I was just going to add, I, mean, I think you're exactly right, that the, the Common Core State Standards have the potential to complicate course taking patterns, but I don't look at that as a threat to the, uh, the longitudinal validity of the study. I look at that as an opportunity for our study to next time around to tell you whether or not things have actually changed. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Annette Cook, also with Shelton State Community College. She comments that there were, she notes there are no students in the advanced category of results from the curriculum level. Why is that? Who falls into the advanced category and what defines advanced? Cornelia, can you start us off? I will start us off because um, advanced represents a very advanced coursework and attainment on the NAEP scale. Uh, what's reported in the high school transcript studies are the averages of groups. I'll let Peggy and Jack speak to that a little more. So, so what we have in the report, this is Peggy Carr again on page 21, you'll see a mapping of the average scores, a sort of a, a profile of average scores for the various achievement levels. But they're just that, they're averages, and so you have variation around those means. So there are students 
that will be in the advanced level, individual students that will be in the advanced level um, that are not shown here. Um, but the bulk of the students, the average uh, designations that we have here show that they are not filing in the advanced level. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Christopher Baker. Christopher comments that there seems to be a growing trend in high school to eliminate weighting for AP and honors courses towards GPA calculations and also the elimination of class ranks on transcripts. This, in spite of long-term knowledge that these are good indicators of post-secondary success. Does your study show any correlation or draw any conclusions about GPA and or class rank and post-secondary success? Jeff? First, let me just say, in terms of our own GPA uh, calculation, we, we don't we use a four-point scale when we do not weight uh, any any courses any differently than any others. Uh, that said, you know I think a, a couple of folks have brought this up already. You know this is a, a cross-sectional study uh, looking at the transcripts of graduates, and we, we're, in, in this particular study, we are not following uh, these folks longitudinally into, into post-secondary, and so. From these data alone, uh, we're not able to, to tell you something about their success. Uh, Cornelia mentioned that the, the National Assessment Governing Board has an ongoing research project trying to identify, uh, you know, can we use what we know about NAEP that, that, and map that back to post-secondary success, and we hope to, uh, to make some progress in that front. Just, just one clarification, Jack. At the present time, the studies that have been commissioned are looking at preparedness for entry-level coursework or entry-level job training, not success. And we hope to eventually be able to look at that over time, but right now that won't be in the 2011 report. This is Peggy Carr again. Well, what we do know about uh, attributing success uh, to the outcome is that uh, students who take uh, AP courses, IB courses, do score higher or make both in math and science. And the, uh, these students are also uh, in higher um, curriculum level um, destination, and they perform higher on that, and in the higher levels of uh, achievement level. Mm -hmm. So we know that. I think the, the, the issue is how is um, those scores, those designations correlated with success? That's the, that's the unknown factor. Great. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Patricia Porter. She'd like to know what recommendations you have for educator preparation programs for mathematics teachers to address the findings of this study. Henry, would you like to comment on that? Um, I alluded in my uh, my remarks uh, to some exciting things that I think are happening um, at the institution uh, I, that I am a part time instructor at at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. We do offer a minor in mathematics or a minor in science for our um, teacher preparate our teachers. Um, this is uh, for uh, middle grade level teachers, even our elementary teachers. These are course specific preparations in math and science. Um, I'm currently attending the National Council of Teacher of Mathematics conference. I'm hearing many exciting uh, really exciting efforts around uh, STEM centers that are being developed in various areas of the country, and these particular centers are working at um, improving teacher understanding and preparation in the STEM courses. Uh, Katie mentioned something that I'm finding um, extremely important myself in working with teachers, and that is to identify, locate uh, rich sources of um, problems and student work and what we can share with teachers so that our their understanding of the courses that we're talking about here and what goes in them and how student work looks as a result of taking them consistently is made available. Um, there's many efforts looking for expanding videotaped classes and teachers uh, in those classes that can be a help across the country. So there's a part of me that's very excited with this effort. And the bottom line is the preparation of teachers and uh, not only teachers coming into the field, but uh, in fact, I think in many respects, um, that's, uh, that's very exciting and there is movement there. 
the teachers also who are in the field and are missing out, have missed out on some of that training, also need to have professional development to um, make sure that they're ready for this. So it's an expensive and it does bring some concerns to my mind, but I think there are efforts going on that we can be excited about. Thank you, Henry, and thank you to everyone for your wonderful questions. Uh, we've gone past our hour, and we're mindful of everyone's time, so we're going to close the Q&A portion at this time, but if we were not able to address your question, please know that we will respond to you directly. Uh, thanks, Amy. I also want to thank our panelists today, Doug Buckley, Henry Cranendonk, and Katie Haycock for their participation, and also Dr. Peggy Carr, who is the Associate Commissioner of NCES, for her participation in the question and answer session. Please allow me just a few closing comments. First, I encourage you to visit our NACE site at www.nacesreportcard.gov. That will give you this study, but also various tools, including the data explorer you've heard talked about today that you can use to mine questions, answers to your own questions. Also, if you go to uh, the NAGB.org site, you'll see a release page with the press release and the panelist statements that you've heard today. Uh, if the media outlets who are joining us today are interested in additional Q&A, there's a, quest, a conference call that's taking place at noon today, Eastern Time. Uh, please contact Jessica Hoy at 202-540-8823. H-O-Y at RyanGold.com if you are interested in accessing this information. Third, I just want to thank all of our participants on the webinar today. We appreciate you taking time to uh, listen today, and we hope you will also take a few minutes to complete a brief survey that will appear in the window when you end your session. Uh, please stay tuned for an announcement on the date at which we will be releasing the 2010 NAEP report card on civics which will be uh, present data from grades 4, 8, and 12. Thank you very much.